A lot of poker players see 100 NL as the first stake where the money truly starts to matter. If you're playing 50,000 hands a month at 100 NL and you're winning at three big blinds per 100, you're making $1,500 per month. That's a nice little chunk of change. If you're playing 50,000 hands a month for a year at that win rate, you're playing 600,000 hands a year, you're making $18,000 a year. That could fund multiple really cool holidays. Maybe in some countries, it's actually enough to make a living. So 100 NL is a good thing to aim for. It's really where your hobby, poker, can begin to impact your life in a very positive way. But most poker players never get there. And here's why. Leak number one for why most people don't reach this stake where they can actually start to make a decent amount of money from the game is that quite simply, they're not getting all in with their mighty value hands. They're not making enough money. Now don't take this literally. You can't get all in every time that you have the nuts because the pot size matters, but not building the pot enough and then not going all in when you have built the pot is a huge problem. You could suffice to say that people need to value bet bigger with their value hands. Like here, for example, we have the ace four, we go for the cold four bet. This is something I expect to do really well in this situation, actually. I don't want to go on about that for too long, but it's quite difficult for a small blind to jam enough hands here and defend enough here, especially in a pool where people aren't going to be too used to facing this. So if you are playing 50 NL trying to break through, you're playing 25 NL, you're playing 10 NL, and this is a reg three betting you here, people are going to be very afraid of this cold four bet and doing it with a hand like this is almost certainly just really good. And so villain calls in this occasion, which they're going to do with a range like some eights, nines, tens, maybe people getting scared with jacks sometimes, even though they should probably jam that. Ace queen suited, king queen suited, king jack suited, stuff like this, other suited broadways, some ten nine suited and stuff maybe at some frequency. Bear in mind this is a small blind range before the flop, so it's unlikely to have kind of speculative starting combos in it like a big blind range would. So kind of condensed capped range we're going to be looking at here. And we go for a small bet here. This bet's multi-purpose. It's going to be for value in some sense and that we're doing okay when called. We're getting called by a lot of unpaired hands when we bet the size of the pot, of course. And we're also denying a lot of equity. So if Ellen does want to fold King Jack here or something like that, we are cleaning very effectively. Villain calls, we get the eight of diamonds turn. We decide to check. I don't think bluffing here is going to be better than checking. You could make some argument like, well, if they have nines or sevens, they're going to get scared and they're going to overfold. But they have a lot of tens and jacks in their range as well here. And undoubtedly, we just have a ton of showdown value with the ace four. So I think turning this into a bluff at this point is a stretch too far and would just constitute. That's right. A dreaded polarization error. Say it with me. Polarization error. That's, that's something we don't want to do, right? We don't want to turn a hand that's doing really well as a check into a bluff. So we are going to check back here. River is, of course, the gen card because I only ever show you winning hands. As we know, it's a ploy. Not really you're going to see a losing hand in, in just a minute, are you? I think there's one coming up in this video. Maybe. Maybe. We'll see. So we go for the jam here on the river. Villain's range at this point is going to be some pocket pair, like nines and tens and jacks. And you could make some argument like, well, if he has those hands, he's just always going to fold and you don't actually know that in real life because our bluffing range which is suited broadway here can very easily just go all in here as a bluff and villain is going to have to call with a pair below an ace sometimes and some players will call with those hands sometimes but moreover people are just going to be checking the river here a lot against what's quite a polarized range by us with a hand like ace queen or ace jack suited or ace five suited or something like that so not only can villain hero call here with the jacks of the tens or the nines at some frequency, but they are very unlikely to ever fold an ace and they're going to have an ace a lot. And a big mistake that I see students in our Discord doing when they're posting hands or when they're getting reviewed by one of our coaches is that they're very often doing something like betting 40 big blinds here or 32 big blinds here. And I think the leak that really drives that kind of mistake is something to do with targeting. I'm going to target pocket jacks. I'm going to pick a sizing I think jacks will call. And the problem with that is twofold. One, Jacks might not call any sizing in two. It might call all in if it just feels like bluff catching and not believing you. So, and that ignores the rest of villain's range as well, which is all like ace X and stuff that's calling any size. So with this two pair that's functional and is playing and is beating any ace, you definitely want to go all in. This time we do get paid off by the ace queen suited, but this is all about magnitude trumping frequency. Magnitude of bet size trumps the frequency you get called at. 
all else being equal. And here's a proof of that from the Carrot Poker School. So this is Greed Theorem, otherwise known as River Greed Theorem from grade two of the Carrot Poker School. And this is the concept that if your hand lands on the river, meaning just arrives on the river with massive equity, so it's winning almost always, and you choose to bet, you will do better by betting bigger and maximizing magnitude rather than betting smaller and maximizing frequency, meaning frequency you get called at, unless villain is raising at a high frequency versus smaller bet. So there are some exceptions to this. There's some spots where your opponent's range is polarized enough that when you bet small, they raise many of the hands they're continuing anyway. And of course, in that case, it makes sense to either check or use a smaller bet against the more polar range. But in the spot we looked at there, where our opponent actually checks the river to us in that four bet pot, they're going to be much more condensed. Their range is going to be full of bluff catchers rather than hands that are waiting to spring a trap and raise for value or hands that are waiting to check raise bluff. In fact, we're going to get raised very infrequently in a spot like that if we go small. And therefore, the proof below in the table applies fully. Consider this. If you size your bet on the left-hand column here as 5% of the pot, you are going to get called a really high percent of the time. In fact, in order to meet minimum defense frequency, assuming that that's what Velen is doing, and they, they aren't always because in some bad world sphere range, you're not meant to try and defend that amount of the time and then exploitative reality people do overfold in many spots too but if we assume that the opponent is trying to meet that mdf and is trying to call a certain percentage of their range to neutralize our ability to bluff then they're going to be calling us 96.3 percent of the time when we bet five percent of the pot that's the way the math checks out and that means that the surplus profit we get like not including the pot as it stood when we bet into it but the extra prof profit we get from betting here is 4.81 chips or 96.3 percent of five chips that we've actually bet or five percent pot that we've bet there you can trace this all the way up to the point where when you're betting 75 percent of the pot you're meant to be getting a defense out of your opponent now about 57 percent of the time and then you know you get 75 percent of 57 which is 42.9 in in surplus profit there from the river bet and you can trace this all the way up to 400% pot at which point you're only being called 20% of the time in GTO in a neutral world but you're making of course 20% of a very big number 20% of 400 which is 80 chips so the bigger you go the more money you make this is how greed theorem works and not understanding this theoretical building block of the game is a massively common reason for why people get a spot like this wrong and actually end up betting too small so the all-in in the river here isn't just some exploitative thing it's not anything fancy it's actually just pure bare bones poker theory applied in real life and i don't see a sufficient reason to want to deviate from that here given the villain's range is very condensed and again the caveat not likely to raise us a lot if we bet smaller so that is how we take a slice of carrot poker school and apply it to real life okay let's move on to the second leak that stops people reaching the holy land of 100 nl Leak number two is not finding bluffs on runouts that are really good for your range. The Carrot Poker School has a thing or two to say about this topic as well. And again, the hand you're about to see here is more theoretical than it is exploitative. But having solid theory is a way to not hemorrhage EV as you move up through the stakes, right? So it's very important to have these aggression building blocks down in your game if you want to reach a stake like 100 NL these days. So we open the cutoff here, the big blind peels. The flop is 4-6 deuce, and this is a board that if we're playing against a competent player, we need to play mostly range check here, basically. But when we're against a weaker player who will not be aggressive enough and doesn't really understand that we don't just get to bet here willy-nilly, I think we can build some bets, especially since recreational players generally lead the turn at a pretty high frequency, but don't attack enough against the flop bet. So betting your kind of semi-trash like this is going to work out really well exploitatively. Villain calls, the turn is the 10 of hearts. It's a very, very good card for our range. At one point in time, I was obsessed with the turn being a 9 or a 10 or a jack when you're the sea better. And my friend Sam would kind of mock me for it and say it was like my fad of the week or whatever. But yeah, that is actually a really common concept. The, the cards that your opponent folds the most on the flop when it's a low board are typically not the ace or the king because those are like big showdown value hands, right? But they're actually things like the jack, the 10 and the queen. 
And so this 10 turns smashes our range because a lot of our air balls from the flop have just hit top pair. And moreover, top pair is easily strong enough to value bet now. And our opponent's range kind of by and large whiffs this card. So going for a barrel here with 9-7 in clubs, I don't really care what theory thinks. It probably thinks that this exact type of hand is like one of the only things that we need to give up or something. But I doubt there'll be a big EV swing between betting and checking. I think in real life, betting is good. We do that. I think we'll get raised really infrequently, yada yada. The river is the ace of spades, clearly a, a very good card for us now. Our opponent doesn't really get to call twice with ace x unless it's two pair here. For the most part, okay, maybe like ace five, ace three can call again. I'm not really sure about that against our turn sizing. I think they're going to get like close to indifferent. But for the most part in real life, I don't think Villain's really going to have much ace x here. A lot of their range at this juncture is missed pair plus draw hands like six, five, five, four, fives, threes, sevens, eights, nines, six x, etc. So there's a lot of fold equity here. In theory, there's a decent amount of fold equity. This is obviously a decent card for our range. While we're not barreling turn with ace, king, ace, queen, that has a lot of showdown value, we have hit some ace x on this river. I think the king or queen river would be better for us. But nevertheless, in real life, this is just a spot where the board has run out fairly okay for our range, in theory. And in real life, I think we'll see an overfold here because our opponent has to bluff catch quite a lot one pair. I don't think this is a spot to overbet because the opponent's range is getting a bit too polarized to two pair on the ace and then like some very weak hands. So the ace typically makes some hands very strong, like ace-5, ace-3, ace-6, ace-4, ace-10, ace-deuce, and it makes other hands really weak, like pocket sevens in absolute terms, and we do know that recreational players do think in absolute terms. So going for this river bet, very important thing to do in real life. This is mainly an exploitatively mandatory play, but I'm going to show you a little bit of theory and we'll see what the Carrot Poker School has to say on reasonable runouts for your range and bluffing them. One concept you're going to want to make sure that you understand is that of the pot odds norm. The pot odds norm is the quantity of fold equity that we would expect a bet to yield based on its size compared with that of the pot in a neutral world. So neutral world just means nobody has a range advantage. The player facing the bet is defending enough of the time to make the better indifferent to bluffing and the better isn't incentivized to be bluffing all of their error or anything like that. Their average bluff is going to be, let's say, break even blockers aside instead of winning. That's the sort of situation that we expect in a neutral world. And the pot odds norm just describes that mathematical break-even point for a bluff. And, you know, you bet pot, that's 50%. You bet half pot, that's 33%. It's basically just bet divided by bet plus pot, right? Risk, risk into risk reward is the formula for that. Risk divided by reward, that is. So when your fold equity is normal, that means that theoretically speaking, you're probably in a kind of neutral world, right? Where no one's range is doing better than anyone else's. But as the world starts to become favorable, what you see in GTO is that the player with the unfavorable range, who's actually suffering in the spot and has too many bad hands, not enough good hands, is going to be folding more than this pot odds norm. That means that they're not going to be meeting a minimum defense frequency that's mathematical because to do so would be to make matters worse. It would be to cut off one's nose to spite one's face. So in an unfavorable world, especially where that player is in position, you sometimes see that fold equity actually drops, although it's not a linear relationship like this. And that's due to a nuanced point that in an unfavorable world, GTO assumes that the, the better is already restraining their bluffs to not be over bluffing, right? So nevertheless, there are some unfavorable worlds where when you bet out of position, you get less fold equity than this MDF amount, pot odds norm amount, whatever you want to call it. So the idea with this slide is that when a runout comes, that's really good for your range. And I'm not sure the ace runout is like quite all that in that hand I showed you. I think a king would be better, for example. But there will be situations where the board runs out in ways that say complete gut shots and bring over cards and stuff like that. And then the turn barreler, as it were, is launched into a favorable world. Their range is doing better than the opponents, not just in the fact that it's uncapped, but in the fact that a lot of the air combos are hitting and therefore the fold equity is higher than the break-even point, and they've actually got to bluff with all of their air combos. So playing around in a solver, pile solver, GTO wizard, whatever you have, is a useful way to, to learn where GTO actually says, your hand is mandatory to bluff because this runout is so good for you, and you don't have air here very often, and your opponent's range is struggling. Your fold equity literally soars in spots like that, not just exploitatively, but in theory as well. If this feels a bit tough, this theory that we're doing here, don't worry, you can start the Carrot Poker School journey at grade one. We're like a third of the way through grade two at this point. This snippet comes from grade two, lecture three. 
there are three grades in theory of the carrot poker school not in there are three grades but they're theoretical grades right grades one two and three are theoretical and they're on carrotcorner.com and grady is the mass data driven exploitative one so you can check all of that out on carrot corner you don't have to start at grade two but obviously if you grab all the grades together there is a discount for that so some people do that but i definitely recommend starting at grade one so don't worry if this feels a little bit above your head right let's move on to the third thing now that stops people getting to 100 nl what's that you say i didn't show the results of the hand nah I would never do something like that. Maybe other coaches? Not this coach. This coach always shows results. I'm sure I already showed you. If you stormed off raging that I didn't show the result of the hand, I get it. Like, I kind of get it. But maybe you don't quite have the right reasons for being here. Maybe you don't deserve to play the game. But I'll show you anyway. We bet and villain folded. Maybe I showed you that before and that was all just silly. Who knows? The editor knows. Maybe they'll tell you on screen. Ace four of diamonds. We open UTG. We get called. This is rule number three, which basically goes as follows. Don't fold to fish when they half pot the river or something like that. That's a direct quote. When they half pot the river or something like that. Maybe to put it a bit more generally, don't fold to small river bets from recreational players. Okay. Because these can be all sorts of stuff. They can be mergy. They can be polarization mistakes. They can be just random spew. And very often, bet size equals hand strength with your aquatic opponents. Very often, fish are going to pot it when they like their hand because they're like, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. I've got to get all of the monies. I've got to make as much money as possible. And when they're bluffing... They're like, oh, I wonder if I can just steal this pot for a nice little cheap investment. Just get in and out here and just not be noticed. And I'll just, you know, walk off into the sunset with this pot and you won't know. That's kind of the fish pathology. So we have Ace Four Diamonds. We opened, we got called in two spots from EP. We went ahead and checked the flop. I think you can see about the flop. I think you can check the flop. I never mind leaving the range of a recreational player wide when I have a hand that's not really going to three street it on too many runouts. That's just a little tip for you. I never mind that. So I do check here. And it checks through to the turn and this player leads. And we're not like thrilled here, but we have top pair and a gutter. And we do know the recreational players will merge here. They will lead a seven. They will lead a draw. They will lead nothing sometimes. They will like see two things going on with pocket fours and be like, oh my God, a pair and a draw? Let's go. This is the kind of thing they will do, right? So we're definitely calling here. And then when you face this bet, if you face this in a GTO trainer, okay, it's probably going to call our like psycho bluff raise with ace four here based on the blockers and the unblockers and all of that that we don't really care about at this moment in time. But what's going to happen is in real life that folding would just be absurd. And the, I, I've seen students fold here and you might be looking at this spot being like, well, this is never a fold and no one would ever fold here, Pete, and, and shut up and you're talking shit. But I promise you I've seen people fold here because they level themselves into thinking, well, this guy led twice into two opponents. Their value range beats Ace-4 and I think it's under bluffed. And that's normally a pretty good thought process if it weren't for one fatal caveat. You're against a fish, ladies and gentlemen, and the fish will merge not just with Ace-6, but also with many, many combos of weird shit. Exhibit A. This is some really weird shit. I don't have a carrot poker skill slide for you for this hand because this is a fully exploitative thing. In fact, I do have a carrot poker skill slide for you because I just remembered. I can show you stuff from Grady as well. Check this out. So this comes from lecture nine of Grady of the carrot poker school. And what we're plotting here along the X axis here is the bet size that an opponent used. And then here we have the weak percentage on the river, which is basically when they showed down fourth pair or worse. So this is like our sort of cutoff point for where we start distinguishing bluffs from, I guess, value bets or like weird merges or whatever. So this doesn't actually, this graph isn't the one that captures the data about the fish because the fish also have merges and it gets insanely complicated trying to decide like how often they're bluffing slash merging and it's like one continuous spectrum and it doesn't really work for recreational players to plot the data in this way but it does work for regulars who are a bit more polarized and you can see a really cool phenomenon here is that regs typically increase their bluff frequency as the bet size goes up as they should with the exception of when they actually get over pot it goes down the way in the data here 
and it starts going up a bit more gradually step by step so they're basically not bluffing enough for bigger sizes and bluffing too much for smaller sizes you can see the gto line here is much smoother gto is doing a a better job here at actually having a lot of weak hands for b33 when it's a continuous aggression so i want to be really clear here this is looking at triple barrel this graph it's looking at facing three bets so that's not to say regs aren't bluffing too much with small bets when they're block betting probing like they're using like scattered aggression lines as we would call them where they've checked and then they're betting or there's been passive action and then they're betting this is all continuous aggression so this is like facing three bets so they under bluff with the really small sizing then as they start to get up to these sizes they bluff more normally but then it goes down again as they start to over bet but the data with the recreational player is insane and in that if you start cutting off the the weak hands at like second pair or third pair and you start including merges in this you will see that when they bet small, they have a weak hand an enormous amount of the time. I won't tell you exactly how often, but an enormous amount of the time. And when they're betting big, they're under bluffing massively. So if you imagine the recreational line, we didn't plot it on this graph because it doesn't work with this data. But if you imagine that recreational player line is basically tons of random hands for the smaller bet sizing and then the bigger bet sizing, the bluff frequency does go down as the dog is remarking here. It actually starts to go down the way when they get up to like pop. So what you'll see from recreational players is that their bluff frequency is higher when they're using half pot than when they're using pot, even though it's meant to be the opposite way around, right? In GTO, you're meant to be able to include more bluffs in your range as you increase the price and give your opponent worse odds. But that is not the way it actually goes in reality. So there we have it. Just don't make these folds. I've seen people make, maybe not quite this fold, although some students have, but I commonly see folds in many spots where you have like a fairly low down absolute hand strength hand and a recreational player just stabs the river for like 40% pot and you've got like third pair or something and these hands are all basically calls right I don't want to put it in too much of a black and white way because you need to be careful with that in poker but when a recreational player bets like half pot or less or even 60% pot like there or thereabouts against you on the river just try calling honestly just start calling and thank me later like this is going to transform your win rate you're going to see that you might lose more than you win in some of these spots in other spots you might win more than you lose but it doesn't matter remember pot odds are the the driving force behind the mechanics of poker when your opponent bets a sizing like the one they bet on river here which is essentially half of the pot we need 26 percent equity to make a profitable call here so even if we were taking the worst of it let's say two thirds of the time, which I don't even think we are, we'd still be printing money, like absolutely churning the money out. Like it's 1920s Germany, mid inflation, the Deutsche Mark is worth nothing. Like that kind of style of printing money, only the money we're printing is worth moving up in poker, building your bankroll and getting to the promised land of 100 NL. If you like our stuff, it's carrotcorner.com. I will be updating you soon about the launch date of the subscription service. We're just getting a few final things in place. It's been a ton of work sourcing all the videos, getting all the coaches, getting everything moving in the right direction. But we are very close, my friends, to giving you a launch date really soon. Also, coming up shortly on the 1st of April, we might have a little sale going on at CarrotCorner.com for Easter. We do that every year. We may just be doing it again this year. Keep your ear to the ground. There may be some discounts. All right. I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.